Egypt is famous for the spectacular gold artefacts entombed with the pharaohs some three and a half thousand years ago. Perhaps the best known piece is Tutankhamun's funerary mask that contains over 300 ounces of gold. What isn't so well known is that most of the pharaohs presided over large empires of copper mines in addition to gold. The time of the pharaohs corresponds almost exactly to the Bronze Age. Techniques for smelting copper metal from oxide ores had recently been developed and the earliest alchemists were experimenting with the addition of tin to make a stronger alloy. It was used in everything from hand mirrors to tools and surgical instruments. Copper was also used in Egyptian faience, the light blue translucent glaze that characterises many of the ceramic objects found in the pharaoh's tombs. It was made by mixing powdered malachite with a soda flux and finely ground quartz, then firing the objects in a pottery kiln. But where did all that gold and copper come from? Part of the answer is hidden in the mountains of the eastern desert behind me. So let's go and take a look at that and see if we can unravel some of the mystery. This is Wadi Dara. There's no surface water here, and in summer, the air temperature regularly reaches a scorching 50 degrees Celsius. Clearly, the ancient Egyptian prospectors who came here to find and mine gold were extremely tough and tenacious people. The mineralization occurs as a series of steep dipping sheeted veins. You can see the workings behind me where the ancient miners have picked out individual veins down the face of the hill there. The gold was mined by gouging individual veins out of the rock, leaving lines of pits like these. And there are literally thousands of them scattered all over the hills here over an area of several square kilometers. Each one of them contributing just a few grams of gold to the Pharaoh's treasure. Excavating the veins would have been a slow and painful task. This was the dawn of the Bronze Age and the only tools that the miners would have had would have been stone tools and fire to break apart the solid diorite host rock here. The scale of the operation is even more impressive when you consider that every gram of gold extracted would have required many kilograms of food, water and firewood to be transported into this remote and inhospitable site. And considering that there's no surface water here, most of the ore would probably have to have been transported out for processing. The Romans have been here too, following after the pharaoh's miners with iron tools. The empire, with its thirst for gold coins and ceremonial finery, probably consumed almost as much gold as the pharaohs. They built these houses and they enlarged some of the workings, but they were still unable to process sulphide ore, so they were restricted to the oxide zone. The ancient miners here were mainly chasing gold, but most of the veins here also contained copper, as you can see from all the chrysocolla and malachite scattered all over the dump here. And this copper might have been a source for their early alchemists experimenting with bronze alloys. This little pile of slag here tells me that at least at some point in history, the ancient miners here attempted to smelt copper from the ore. You can see that bubbly texture on the surface there, that was from the slag floating on top of the melted ore. One unusual thing about this system is the lack of alluvial workings. A sheeted vein system like this, with veins all over the hills and narrow gullies like this one, should be an ideal situation to concentrate alluvial gold. I know there's some historical workings just up the hill there, and I can see some vein material in the creek right here, so there's a pretty good chance that there's significant alluvial gold in this gully. Anywhere else like this, the gully would have been stripped out and there'd be piles of rock neatly stacked along the side of the gully from historical alluvial mining. But I haven't seen a single pit like that here. I'm not sure if that was just a factor of the historical mining attitude or whether there actually isn't any gold here. But it's certainly something to consider. The volume of alluvial in this gully here is nothing significant, but in the larger waddies down near the main vein zone, that's a potential significant resource. 
In a large wadi like this one, the volume of alluvium can be significant. But another thing to consider in an environment like this, where it's really dry, is the potential for exotic copper. On the rare occasions when it does rain here, the rainwater leaches copper from the oxide zone in the hills there and transports it down into the wadi beneath me. And as the water evaporates through the gravel, the copper reprecipitates as copper carbonates and sometimes native copper. In a system this size and wadis this large, that can be a significant resource. So don't build the mine office in the wadi below the vein zone. Okay, let's take a quick look at the geology of the deposit. There's a neoproterozoic basement of coarse grained tonalites and leucocratic granites of the Arabian Shield. It's intruded by a slightly younger complex of diorites, microgranodiorites, andesite porphyry, and microgranite porphyries. There are also a few rhyolitic porphyry plugs, but they might be feeders for a Precambrian sequence of rhyolitic ignimbrites, tuffs, and volcanic clastics that lies unconformably over the intrusive complex. Finally, there are the modern wadi gravels that cover a significant portion of the system. The veins cut all of the intrusives in the complex, and a few get out into the basement but none have been found in the overlying ignimbrites. To give you an idea of the scale here, this grid has one kilometre squares. The intrusive complex that hosts the mineralisation has a very broad range of composition, from intermediate, like this hornblende diorite, to very acid rocks, like aplytic microgranites. The primary composition of the intrusives in the complex is a little bit more potassic than usual. At the north end, there's lots of alkali granites, and down here at the south end, there's diorites that often have more biotite than hornblende. The veins were probably exposed in late Proterozoic time, but then they were covered by a sequence of Precambrian volcanics and sediments, and you can see some of the horizontal layering of that sequence in the mountain behind me here. The veins stayed buried for 500 million years, but fortunately for the pharaohs, recent uplift and erosion has exposed the Proterozoic rocks again and revealed the treasure. Most of the veins are only a few centimetres thick and they start with specular hematite infill, followed by fine comb quartz and then interstitial sulphide. This is Gossen mostly after chalcopyrite. You can see a bit of malachite and sometimes chrysocolla there, the secondary minerals and then sometimes they have a final infill phase of anchoritic carbonate, which you can see from this mustard-coloured gossen over here. Chalcopyrite is the dominant sulphide in all the veins. You can see a big lump of it here, and it's partially converted to chalcosite in the supergene zone. In the oxide zone, it's dominantly chrysocolla, this pale blue colour, and some malachite, the lighter green. This piece of vein shows the fine comb quartz texture very well, with all of the interstitial space occupied by chalcopyrite that's partially oxidised. There's specular hematite in almost all the veins, and even a little bit of magnetite in some of them, particularly in the better mineralised ones, like this one here. All of this is specular hematite. There's some nice big boxworks there after chalcopyrite, and that lump there is magnetite. Most of the veins like this one have a propolytic alteration halo that's two or three times the width of the vein. This one's in a diorite and it converts all the mafic minerals to chlorite. Most of the mineralized veins here have propolytic alteration halos, but a few out on the margins of the system, like this one here, have philic alteration halos. In the sample here, you can see this is a gossonous vein here with some boxworks after pyrite, and all this white material on the outside of the vein is sericite after feldspar in a granite host rock. In the centre of the system, there's some intrusives with strong potassic alteration. This is a microgranite diorite, but it's a dark grey colour because it's got lots of secondary biotite and magnetite alteration. In this piece, you can see clusters of fine-grained secondary biotite and magnetite pseudomorphing rectangular hornblende fenocrysts. The system has large areas of potassic, philic, and propolytic alteration, 
but there's no B veins like a typical porphyry system. The system's hosted in a large intrusive complex, the veins are sheeted style, and the principal mineral is gold. But this seems like too much copper for a typical IRGD system. Some of the veins have lots of specular hematite and some magnetite, but there's no nearby iron deposits to support a connection with an IOCG model. Part of the answer is probably in this rock here. It's a microgranite porphyry and its hornblende and biotite phenocrysts are very often replaced by clusters of secondary biotite and magnetite, potassic alteration. It has a variety of textures indicating high fluid content in the magma, including graniferic matrix, seriate textures and myarolytic cavities. And just occasionally you find little myarolytic cavities with grains of chalcopyrite inside them. These are the hornblende and biotite phenocrysts replaced by secondary biotite and magnetite. And this is a grain of chalcopyrite in a myarolytic cavity. And this morning, one of the Egyptian geologists here found this beautiful big myarolytic cavity. And here is Mr. Yahe, the guy that found that huge myarolytic cavity. It's in a microgranite porphyry and it's lined with quartz crystals. You can see some nice big euhedral quartz crystals poking into the cavity there. There's some beautiful little feldspar crystals poking into the cavity here. But most importantly, there's some big pieces of chalcosite after chalcopyrite, and it's surrounded by chrysocolla there. So that tells you that this fluid came out of this granitoid and most importantly, that fluid had copper in it, lots of it. So we don't need any fancy isotope analyses here to tell us that the sulfur and the fluid are magmatic. Myarolytic cavities are by definition samples of magmatic fluid. I've made a previous video about how they form and I'll put a link to it in the top right corner. We found a critical piece of the puzzle in this quartz vein. At first it just looks like quartz infill. But when you look a bit closer, you can see that the edge of the vein is there. And these are feldspar crystals growing into the vein and then followed by quartz and finally this piece of chalcopyrite that's partially oxidized to girthite. And you'll notice that outside the vein, it has very little or no alteration in this microgranite porphyry. That's important because that sequence of infill is exactly the same as we see in the myarolytic cavities. And the fact that there's no alteration around the veins suggests that that fluid is still in equilibrium with the surrounding rock. So those veins probably represent the exact point at which the fluid is escaping from the magma. The fact that it's still got chalcopyrite in the vein suggests that it's got copper in the fluid and that those veins might represent the earliest stage of the main mineralization event. We also found evidence of a magmatic source for the iron in the veins, in a set of sheeted aplite dikes cutting the diorites at the south end of the complex. They have cores of vein style quartz and magnetite, illustrating that the fluid exolving from the microgranite magmas was carrying abundant iron. Now, I don't think there was quite enough fluid there to explain all of the vein system here, but at the very least, it suggests that this is a very close relative of the intrusion that's driving the system and that an IRGD model is probably the best fit. The closest analogue that I can think of is the recently discovered Winu deposit in Western Australia. It's a big sheeted vein system with roughly equivalent value in copper and gold. The veins are lined with fine comb quartz and chalcopyrite is the dominant sulphide. The Winu veins are hosted in metasediments, but the hydrothermal fluid is thought to have come from an alkaline intrusive complex beneath the deposit. So perhaps Wadi Dara represents a similar system eroded deep enough to expose the intrusive complex that drove the system. We don't know the grade or the depth extent of the Wadi Dara system because it hasn't been drilled yet, but here's an outline of the Winu copper ore body at the same scale, so it certainly covers a comparable area. The next generation of explorers here at Wadi Dara is a new breed of young, well-trained Egyptian geologists.
perhaps with their enthusiasm and modern mining methods, Egypt will one day be as famous for copper as it already is for gold.